Uh, good morning. We'll uh, go ahead and get started. <laughs> We're uh, very pleased to have you all here in, uh, in the Baker Institute and here for the summit. Uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, three days, two days. And uh, let me introduce uh, my co-host, uh, Bobby Alford. Well, thank you, George, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, we deeply appreciate your being here and participating in this, this summit, and uh, we appreciate your support uh, in coming and participating as well. There's some things I'd like to explain at the very beginning, and then we'll, and we'll get on to the other part of the welcoming business, and that is um, the restrooms are out these doors and down separate halls. The men are over here, the women are over here. Uh, the program is going to be pretty lengthy, and so uh, it may be that uh, you will want to uh, find those facilities uh, sooner than later, but hopefully uh, not without any difficulty. Uh, finally, let me say uh, that the theme this year uh, for this summit was one that was chosen uh, by the organizing committee uh, uh, for the summit. And based, uh, it was really uh, led by the fact that uh, there have been many accomplishments and there are many things to revisit in view of the success that they have been. Uh, and in fact, there's the completion of the International Space Station now this past year. Uh, there is the uh, in, end of the shuttle era as we knew it uh, uh, this past year. Uh, the, uh, there's now a beginning of uh, new ways to access the International Space Station and, and beyond. Uh, I would like to bring uh, one thing to your attention. Um, Rod Jones did a lot of work on uh, creating some posters and they are and uh, for NASA and they are uh, shown here in the facility of the uh, Baker Institute the largest uh, uh, poster is on on this wall uh, toward the end of the of the uh, the uh, facility there and uh, the smaller one is inside this uh, Ante room here, and I uh, urge you to take a look at it. They're actually very uh, masterly uh, design uh, things, and an update that's very important. Gives you a feeling for how large this uh, space station, the International Space Station, is, and how marvelous it has been to have the collaborative, uh, cooperative. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in the teams that have uh, participated in this from the various nation, nations. It's uh, really a, a, an excellent model for um, communication, uh, coordination, and uh, collaboration. Uh, as a matter of fact, you, you, many of you who've been here in the past have heard me talk about the four C's, which are critical to making progress in almost anything particularly as it deals with research. Uh, one of the outcomes that's not really apparent when one thinks back on the summits is there's been an evolution, uh, a more formal evolution, of centers for space medicine. And uh, one has been, one has evolved here at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Jeff Sutton was the inspiration behind that. And it's been extremely successful. And we now know that throughout the United States, there are other centers for space medicine and academic institutions that are coming about, as well as some uh, overseas. The, uh, as I look at those posters instantly, to go back and visit that a moment, um, I'm reminded of a very important uh, milestone in the development of the International Space Station, and that was 
something uh, that was called at the time, in 1993, as the President's um, Committee for the redesign of the space station. I was privileged to serve on that committee, which was chaired by uh, Dr. Vest uh, from uh, MIT. And as I look back on it, uh, I don't think we had any clear idea that the station would look the way it does today. Uh, there was some choices to make, and the committee made those choices, and they were, of course, presented up the line, and uh, that is uh, how the station evolved beginning at that time. I think there's one other symbol, and I've already talked about the Center for Space Medicine, and that has been that uh, it's really become more and more a pipeline for the future, and you'll hear some things about this in, in the group discussions, particularly those focus, focused on education. One thing I'd like for you to give some attention to, because we use it every year, and that is at your seat, uh, there'll be some forms to evaluate the program, give us feedback about that part of it that you thought was particularly worthwhile and any part of it you didn't think was worthwhile. Because we use that as a gauge to make decisions about continuing to have summits as we go forward. And um, I don't want to bias what we've learned from them by telling you some details about it, but it is very important uh, in the process of uh, going forward uh, once we have that input and can uh, evaluate the responses. Um, Having said uh, all of that, and in the interest of time, I'm going to turn the podium back over to Mr. Abbey for his uh, continued remarks and discussion of the program. Thank you. I think as uh, Bobby said, uh, the shuttle era has ended, and now we're gonna be operating the space station uh, with the existing capabilities and the new capabilities that are coming into being. But that's gonna make it even more critical uh, with the limited logistics we have uh, to make sure that we get a good return from the space station. And I think that's only gonna happen if we have a cooperation between all the partners and uh, look at sharing facilities and sharing capabilities. So I think as we go through these next two days, I think uh, that should be an important consideration in our uh, deliberations. <clears throat> but uh, I think uh, you'll find uh, the panels to be very interesting ones where uh, we've got a lineup, I think, that goes back right in the beginning in the space station. And I think we have also a, a very, uh, very good keynote speaker this morning. Uh, Dr. Neil Lane uh, served as provost of Rice University in 19, from 1986 to 1993 and then left to become director of the National Science Foundation and then went on to become uh, the president's science advisor to President Clinton and then uh, came back to Rice. He's had a very distinguished career in academia and science and uh, is Malcolm Gill's uh, university professor at Rice, also a professor in, in uh, physics and astronomy at Rice and a senior fellow here at the Baker Institute in science and technology. We feel very fortunate to have him as a, a part of the institute. So let me turn it over to Neil. <clears throat> Thank you very much, George. It's a, one of the great pleasures of being back at Rice is opportunity to work with folks like the great uh, Mr. George Abbey. I continue to learn a great deal from that uh, experience. Uh, this is always a great event every year, and I'm certainly honored to be asked to participate I was asked today to make a few sort of general comments about international cooperation in science and then to add some observations about space stations. So I will try to do that. Uh, but first, a few personal observations. I grew up in the Apollo days, as some of you did, and I dreamt of space travel, still do. But I got really sick on the merry-go-round, and so I ended up an earthbound physicist. So I wasn't ever able to fly in space, but, uh, but I was able to participate, if only really on the sidelines in some space-related events when I was in Washington. 
I had the opportunity to visit John Glenn down at Johnson when he was in training for his shuttle flight. He treated me to a lunch with shrimp cocktail and said the food was a lot better than mercury. I had the pleasure of hosting John and, and uh, Curtis uh, uh, Brown and, and their teammates uh, when they visited the White House to meet President Clinton. And then my office helped helped with working with NASA to arrange uh, for pretty much the whole White House. We just turned out the lights to go down and see the liftoff of John uh, and his crew on the Cape. On another occasion, I tagged along with Dan Golden to come down here and uh, do some, do some uh, time on the simulator. I, I landed it, I, I think, almost safely. I mean, we got a little bit wet, but but otherwise it was uneventful. We suited up in the orange suits, including the diapers, and I have photographs of us. Yeah, not the diapers, but I mean in the, in, in, in the suits, although I threatened to take a picture while we were changing. Uh, I also was serving the Clinton White House when the first element of the space station, uh, Zarya, was launched in November of 1998, and my folks were involved in working with Congress to get some of the funding. It was a little bit tricky during that time. Of course, none of these experiences come anywhere near flying or even being a part of the NASA team or the international partners that do all these and have done all these extraordinary things. But I, I do wonder how it would have gone if I hadn't gotten so sick on the merry-go-round. That's a long way back. I'll come back to space and make some comments specifically about the space station. But let me turn to the general issue of international cooperation in space. And I want to make three points. Uh, the first point is that scientific progress in this country has always benefited from international cooperation, and there have been collateral benefits to that cooperation. Early in the 20th century, there were active collaborations and efforts at organizing international uh, cooperation. Uh, for example, the International Astronomical Union, IAU, International Union of Pure and Applied Physics, IUPAP, started in 1922, and there were several unions that came after that. And in 1931, they came together under an umbrella that we call uh, ICSU, the International Council on Scientific Unions, now includes several hundred international disciplinary councils and, and national scientific societies. Of course, during World War II, international cooperation was extremely important to us. I mean, the UK, for example, brought us expertise in in the radar, for example. In fact, it was their magnetron that we incorporated into our efforts, and there were many other examples of work with our allies on the scientific front. Uh, the work was focused, of course, on the war effort, and we got major boosts from our allies. But then uh, we also got major boosts from a number of outstanding scientists who were escaping Nazi Germany, who came either, either before the war, or in fact, many came after the war, and they were absolutely key to putting the U.S. on its uh, progressive uh, 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 curve, I think, uh, after the war and during the years of the Cold War as well, not only in science but in space efforts as well. Uh, but even during the uh, dark days of the Cold War, scientists were still interacting across uh, the political divide. Uh, it really was what I think of as an early example of what we call science diplomacy. In the mid-50s, of course, we had the International Geophysical Year, the IGY, the U.S. and the USSR and many other countries were a part of that. The idea was to understand more about physical makeup of the Earth and its oceans, its atmosphere. The USSR and the U.S. both launched satellites as a part of that. Of course, Soviets launched the first satellite, uh, Sputnik, and that started the space war, uh, or more accurately, the space race. But in spite of that race, COSPAR was formed, Committee on uh, Science and Space and, Res and Research, in 1958. It was followed by many other efforts at cooperation. 1972, something called the East-West Institute, EASA, was created specifically to encourage cooperation. And throughout the Cold War years, there were many international meetings that were held and involved scientists from both East and West. I attended my first conference in Leningrad, and now St. Petersburg, in 1967 at one of those international conferences. Scientific exchanges were, of course, valuable, but I think even more important was the opportunity to get to know our colleagues uh, across the Iron Curtain. 
However, the space-related space matters, it was more difficult, in part because the Soviet space program was under the military. And uh, Soviets often linked any cooperation on space with cooperation on missile defense and other kinds of military issues. And so, you know, progress was, success was, I would say, off again, on again, uh, depending on the political winds in both our parts of the world and also uh, vexing arms control issues that continued, and a number of notable, I'll just call them, events. So you recall that a few years after Sputnik, one and two in 1957, and our Explorer in 1958, we had the U-2 spy plane that was shot down in 1960, then Yuri Gagarin's and John Glenn's famous flights, 1961, 1962, but then the Cuban Missile <coughs> Crisis in 1962, of course the Kennedy assassination a year later, Vietnam War all through this period into the mid-70s. And then after the Apollo 11 moon landing in 1969, the climate uh, began to shift with detente. And in 1975, we had the Apollo Soyuz, which symbolized to many of us the end of the space race. In 1986, following another period of cool relations because of the Soviet inv invasion of Afghanistan, the Kremlin agreed to decouple non-military space issues from missile defense and Reagan and Gorbachev signed the U.S.-USSR Space Cooperation Agreement. Sadly, of course, that was also the year of the Challenger disaster. Following the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, co cooperation became easier. In fact, in many ways, it became a national priority. Shuttle Mir in 1994, 98, and the space station, of course, from 98 to today, I think will stand as milestones in international cooperation, extraordinarily complex, uh, successful uh, cooperative activities. And today, of course, we depend on our Russian partners for travel to the space station. Second point I wanna make is that international cooperation is not just a good idea, you gotta have it. Any nation that plans to be a leader <clears throat> in any sense of the word in science and technology, and I would argue in anything else, is gonna need uh, to cooperate with partners around the world. It's a cliche to say science knows no borders, but it's true nonetheless. Fundamentals of physics and chemistry and biology and earth science, same in Houston as they are in Moscow and Beijing and London. Researchers often have more in common with their counterparts across the globe than they do with colleagues across the hall. In fact, sometimes they don't even speak with their colleagues across the hall. Um, scientists need access to whatever places, people, facilities are gonna help them discover new things about nature. To quote NSF director Subra Suresh, who said, good science anywhere is good for science everywhere. So let me just list a few examples that I was involved with or following closely for one reason or another. In biomedical research, an example would be the Human Genome Project. <clears throat> Partnership with the UK and other countries to sequence the human genome. First draft genome was released in 2000 when I was in the White House, and the full sequence was completed three years later. In elementary particle physics, following the shutdown of the Tevatron at, at our family lab, the U.S. no longer has a high-energy particle accelerator to do experiments on, and 1,000-plus uh, researchers and their students must travel to CERN. It's not a bad place to go, but it's a long way off uh, to work on the Large Hadron Collider. The U.S. contributed funding, by the way, to both the accelerator construction and the uh, particle detectors, and we were part of that discussion when I was in the White House. In astronomy and astrophysics, there are many examples that one can point to, including both ground-based and space-based instruments, but I'll mention the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, the AMS experiment, led by Nobel laureate Sam Ting. The AMS is designed to detect cosmic rays and help understand antimatter and dark matter, perhaps, in the universe. Last May, the AMS was carried by the shuttle to the International Space Station, and you'll get to hear much more about it tomorrow night from one of the leaders, Maurice Borkman, who's past president of the CERN Council, and who knows all about particle physics and all about the AMS. In earth science and climate change, an example, I think, would be the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It operates under the UN, pulls together thousands of climate scientists all over the world to help coordinate climate research and assess how the climate is changing and likely to change. 
you can hear lots of criticism about the IPCC, much of it political, but not all. Uh, but the science, I believe, of, of climate is rigorous, although it's very complicated science. Scientific collaboration is, I think, unprecedented, and the technical reports are of high quality. These are just a few. You could mention many other examples in many fields. Today, many countries are increasing their research funding. They're building modern research instruments and laboratories and rapidly growing the size of their science and engineering and technical workforce. China's growth curve is particularly steep. If we in this country expect to continue to be a major player in discovery and technological innovation and participate in all the new industries and the jobs that'll flow from that, we need to do two things. We're gonna to need to find the necessary funding to invest in science, engineering, technology, even in these tight times, and we're going to need to strengthen our partnerships with other countries, including China. But even with modest real growth in research funding, the U.S. is not gonna be able to build all the facilities, all the accelerators, telescopes, uh, supercomputer centers, uh, research ships, and airplanes necessary to do the work. Our researchers and their students will need to have access to the most modern instrumentation on the planet, wherever that is. That's gonna require unprecedented degree of international cooperation and an unprecedented amount of mutual trust, I think, between nations. Of course, there's some policy barriers to collaboration, some on the U.S. side, especially following 9-11, things like visas, export controls, including ITAR, which is a particular challenge for space-related research, and some barriers in other countries. And we all need to work together in whatever we can to try to lower those barriers wherever they exist. Finally, my third point. Science, I think, is an ideal vehicle for communicating other nations with other nations on a whole range of important topics. This is what many people mean by the term science diplomacy. The world has huge problems related to energy, climate change, health, water, food, regional conflicts, natural disasters. No nation is immune from these, and all nations will have to work together to solve them. Even in the area of national security, history has shown that science can sometimes be the sole mechanism for communication between nations, and I mentioned an example or two. During the Cold War, under the threat of nuclear exchange, there were many U.S. and Soviet scientists, many of them physicists, who knew one another through their shared research interests and who were arguing for more cooperation in arms control, and they were influential, at least they feel they were, in several important arms control initiatives and treaties. In terms of science diplomacy, there's another factor that I think we ought to think about. There's what I call an asymmetry, to use a kind word, in the technical know-how of many of our world's leaders. In the U.S., the vast majority of political leaders are lawyers. Now tonight, let me remind you, we will have a lawyer giving a talk, and we will be very nice to him. He's the president of my university, David, <laughs> David, David Lebron. In Asia, though, particularly China, it's common for political leaders to have technical backgrounds, often in engineering, and they're able to talk with scientists and engineers about technical matters. I found they even enjoy doing that. When I was fresh out of government, my wife and I were visiting China, and uh, then President Zhang Zemin invited us by for a chat. My wife whispered in my ear, must be a really slow news day in China, but anyway, we spent an hour talking with President Zhang about all kinds of things, and he mentioned in that conversation that uh, he and Bill Clinton had had a conversation about nanotechnology at the previous summit. But I think kind of an unusual discussion to have at the summit. Uh, and by the way, China's been growing its investment in nanotechnology ever since. When I was in Beijing on that occasion, I also met his son, one of his sons, uh, Zhang Mianhun, and uh, he was, I mentioned him because I think he's an engineer and was at one point connected with China's space program. But if he had a chance to read this morning's New York Times, I was surprised to see he appears not in photograph, but mentioned on the front page, because he apparently is helping work a deal between Hollywood and China <laughs> on the film industry. So I assume he's also making money as a result of that. Anyway, my point about asymmetry, given this asymmetry, and know-how, I think our political leaders in this country might want to enlist more scientists, engineers, 
technical, technical professionals in diplomatic efforts. And you, I think you know that President Obama, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, uh, launched a science invoice program, uh, sending distinguished scientists all over the world. I think that needs to grow, be much, much larger, and it would be very good to see that done by other countries uh, as well. So I'll just close with a final thought about the country's future, this country's future, in science and technology. The United States has been through one of its most difficult periods, the attacks on 9-11, the costly and quite unpopular wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, a deterioration of Americans' image in many parts of the world, and most recently, terrible economic recession that affected everyone on the planet. The American public today seems deeply polarized, not only in politics, pretty much everything, and Americans have lost confidence in this country's ability to solve its own problems, let alone help other people solve theirs. And we become consumed by immediate worries of today without much consideration for the future. All this has taken a toll on U.S. science and the U.S. space program. Funding, infrastructure, workforce, and morale. Today it's not hard to find people questioning the future of the U.S. space program and NASA in particular. But even with all of today's uncertainties, I believe we will continue to send men and women into space at some point again leaving low Earth orbit. And we need to be sure we can travel safely and stay healthy. And space medicine, in my view, should be among the highest priorities for the space program. And it should be truly international in scope, including any nation, any nation that wants to cooperate. The International Space Station is where that research can be done and done safely and effectively. One more comment about the non-medical science on the space station. It, I don't quite know what to say about this. It's my impression that that interesting microgravity experiments have been done on the station. Uh, nothing has really captured the enthusiasm of the larger science community, but the station is a young facility. It takes time to generate the most innovative ideas and to see breakthroughs on any front, scientific or economic or any other application. The NIH, the NSF in this country, federal agencies have been going for 60 years trying to figure out how to do this right, and it's still work in progress, and they're not having to do their science on the space station, which is a more complicated environment. I mentioned the AMS. It's an ambitious project. It's had to pass muster through tough reviewers, many of whom I think probably had not much to do with space or the space station in the past. I'm optimistic we'll see some exciting results, and of course you'll hear all about that. Uh, by the way, I should mention that you know the new non-government uh, organization, CASES or CASES, Florida-based organization, that won the contract to manage uh, research on the space station, the portion that will be identified as a national laboratory, not the NASA portion. But it's a complicated job. Uh, they're just getting rolling. They're having some growing pains. I know from discussions that they're trying to move things along fairly rapidly and. I certainly hope for the best on that, so we have to stay tuned. Finally, while this, this uh, meeting today is focused on, on humans in space, I think it's very important to keep in mind that many of NASA's greatest achievements have been in science and many of those robotics. Decades of stunning planetary missions, series of powerful space-based telescopes, including the Hubble, Earth observing satellites, and climate research, and of course, the Hubble was delivered on the shuttle. So what lies ahead? Well, I think all of us are looking forward to a better time, a time when the world's economy is better, when people are less distracted by immediate problems, in fact, when their immediate problems are not so severe. Uh, and they're more optimistic about the future. And like many of you, I'm always searching for reasons to be optimistic. It's what my mother told me to do, and so that's what I'm doing. But I think there is reason for optimism. I spend a lot of time on campuses, as many of you do, Rice and, and other campuses here and in other parts of the world. And I always make it a point to talk with students individually and in groups, when, however it can be arranged. I go away feeling really good about those encounters. What I find on the nation's campuses, and I'm sure it's true elsewhere, are bright, energetic, forward-looking young people who in so many ways are much smarter than I was at their age, who have access to knowledge and technologies that didn't exist in my time 
who have amazing skills at using those technologies, have diverse backgrounds and interests, many being born in other parts of the world, who know uh, the world and the U.S. have huge problems and recognize that they, today's students, tomorrow's leaders, are going to have to help solve those problems. And these young people also know that the United States is not going to be in a position to try to tell everybody else what to do and how to behave, but that this nation will have to lead by good example and by being a good partner. So when I look for reasons to be optimistic, I look to young people on my campus and campuses across the country and across the world uh, and think about how I can help them succeed and perhaps make the world a better place. I know you're helping them as well as they are our future. Thank you very much for allowing me to be with you today.